Hey everybody, you're here because you're interested in how intubation can cause hypotension. In this video, we're going to refer to cardiovascular concepts that were explained in a previous video related to vasopressors and shock. If you haven't watched that video, look in the description below and click on the link. Watch minutes 145 through 13 of that video to understand the cardiovascular components that we're referring to in this video. If you already watched the video, that's great. Let's get started. Here we have our basic cardiovascular system. We have the heart, we have our cardiac afterload or arterial system, and then our venous system. And we have our equations, which tell us how the body homeostatically regulates our vital functions. In the venous system, fluid moves via a pressure gradient where generally post capillary, we're about 20 millimeters of mercury and at the right heart, we're about six millimeters of mercury. Let's pretend that this box is the thoracic space. Normally our filling gradient when we're not inhaling is going to be 20 millimeters of mercury post capillary and six millimeters of mercury at the right heart. So that would give us a filling gradient of 20 minus six or 14 millimeters of mercury. The amount of pressure that we can push with to drive fluid up to the right heart. Now, when we take a breath in, our diaphragm contracts and flattens out, meaning the thoracic space expands. And because I have a larger space with the same amount of gas, the pressure decreases. So now the pressure at the right heart is about four millimeters of mercury. And my pressure post capillary is still 20 millimeters of mercury. This would mean that my filling gradient is 20 minus 4, or 18 millimeters of mercury. This would increase the drive to send fluid back to the right heart. This increase in the filling gradient is related to our normal negative pressure ventilation, meaning we draw air into the thoracic space by expanding the diaphragm to create a negative pressure within the thoracic space so air will flow from the outside to the in following its pressure gradient. Ventilation during endotracheal intubation is positive pressure ventilation, meaning we insert an endotracheal tube to the thoracic space and force air inward. This forced air will expand the diaphragm, but it also increases the thoracic pressure. So instead of being six millimeters of mercury at the right heart, I might now be 10 millimeters of mercury due to the forced pressure that was entered into the thoracic space. This increase in pressure at the right heart decreases my gradient to fill the right heart. So instead of being six millimeters of mercury, I'm now 10 and thus my gradient to fill decreases by four millimeters of mercury. This leads to a decrease in the preload that is filling my right heart and reduces my stroke volume, which leads to a decrease in cardiac output and thus a decrease in blood pressure. I do want to note here that even though the overall effect is a decrease in ventricular filling pressure, preload, if you measure it in an intubated patient, will actually measure higher. So your central venous pressure might measure higher because of the increased intrathoracic pressure. However, this is falsely elevated due to the positive pressure ventilation. Your actually driving gradient to fill the heart is decreased. Patients who are experiencing a hypovolemic shock or any decrease in preload are at high risk of post-intubation hypotension. Let's look at this example. Say someone comes in dehydrated. Instead of a normal 20 millimeters of mercury post capillary, they're 14 millimeters of mercury. That means their filling gradient is 8 millimeters of mercury if it's 6 millimeters of mercury at the right heart. Now let's introduce endotracheal positive pressure ventilation and increase my right heart pressure to 10 millimeters of mercury. Well, now my filling gradient is even more decreased down to four millimeters of mercury. These patients are much more likely to experience hypotension. We can identify patients who are preload down because typically they will compensate for their lower stroke volumes by trying to increase their heart rate to maintain cardiac output. And we can use this to calculate something called a shock index. 
So patients who have a heart rate divided by their systolic blood pressure of greater than 0.9 are high risk for post-intubation hypotension. And it makes sense if you think about it. If you're tachycardic and hypotensive before intubation, you're not likely to get better after intubation. But these are patients that you should strongly consider having vasopressor support on standby and pretreatment with fluid resuscitation prior to intubation. There are other mechanisms that cause post-intubation hypotension. The focus of this talk was to walk through the cardiovascular changes so we could understand what happens when we introduce positive pressure. But taking away the respiratory drive also reduces sympathetic outflow from the nervous system and can cause a decrease in systemic vascular resistance. As well, intubation itself can induce a vagal response which can lead to bradycardia. So in summary, the cardiovascular effects of intubation lead to a decrease in venous return that leads to a decrease in cardiac output, which can cause hypotension. If patients have a shock index, which is the heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure, greater than 0.9, they're high risk for post-intubation hypotension. These patients should get adequate pre-intubation fluid resuscitation and have a vasopressor on standby to support them after. And other mechanisms include reduction in sympathetic output as well as possible bradycardia from vagal stimuli. I hope you got something useful out of this presentation and were able to apply the cardiovascular concepts that we learned in the previous lecture. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to leave a comment below or reach out to me on Twitter at empoisonfarmd. Thanks for watching.